three. Uh, Brian's here. Is is it? How quick can we get them caught up if they weren't at part one or part two? Or Chris, right behind you? Yeah, it's kind of a, kind of an yeah kind of an independent topic. I mean, it's we're 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 putting concepts together, um, but just if you missed part one or part two, I think we can also watch those on YouTube if you wanted to get kind of a general idea of uh, um, what what you might have missed out on. Um, but part three is it kind of like I said, we're, we're kind of taking uh, little branches, uh, if, if that's a, a fair way to put it, into the machine learning space. So if you did, if you missed part one or part two, don't don't let that discourage your attendance. Um, Chris and Brian and, and Dave Holmes are all, all experts and they can get you caught up in no time. And uh, <clears throat> so that, that also, uh, notice we, we'll start a little bit earlier with those. Uh, so the, the networking and the pizza will arrive at 6 and then we'll kind of hope to get going by 6.30 and, and conclude similar at the 8 o'clock sort of time frame. Um, pretty good response from those in the past. So again, if you haven't attended one of those, we highly recommend it. Uh, I think... I think uh, um, those are those are worth your time, and I think let's see, was there anything else? Um, it's obviously a, a renewal, or the renewal is probably, uh, or your chance for renewal without going into what they call arrears, I think, is passed. But of course, that don't let that discourage you too. If you miss that, uh, um, the uh, the time for that that continuous renewal, um, we'll, we'll accept your uh, your your renewal and, and membership at any at any time, of course. And, uh, oh, one of, one of the things I'm going to call out here, I wasn't here last, last month, so Chris went through that when we kind of had our elections, but actually, was this maybe even post-election? Uh, we, we do have a new um, young professional uh, chair who's sitting up, up here, uh, um, Jonathan Trevathan. Um, and so he's a, uh, a grad student at, at Mayo, and he'll be leading our, our young professionals and, and, their, and scheduling those events. So if you have any ideas, feel free to talk to him. Or if you want to know more, email. there you go. His email address is right there. You can contact him there. So we're, we're looking forward to uh, some events from him. And I think that is about it. So we're going to I'm going to head back to the. Uh... If I can. Need to let me bring it up then. Yeah, we'll, we'll let you bring that up, and then we'll do an introduction here. All right, so thanks for coming out tonight. Um, we have a, a, a guest speaker with us um, by the name of Mark Hagen. Uh, Mark has actually been involved in the IEEE for probably a long time. He's been, at, he's been involved with our local section uh, for, for a number of years as well. He's held position or our, our PACE position while he was in Rochester. And uh, this is, he tells me this is the third time that he's presented uh, to the group. So... You know, it's it's kind of like it's one of those uh, privileges, you know, that, that gets that gets uh, um, recognized. It's kind of like you know the number of times you host Saturday Night Live, you know, that gets mentioned every time. He's he's so good, we brought him back for a third time. So, if in case you haven't been there for those previous three times, here's Mark's bio. Uh, Mark has been a practicing electrical engineer for almost 40 years. He's worked for IBM, Western Digital, and Texas Instruments. Currently employed by Monolithic Power Systems which is a power semiconductor manufacturer. Mark has 29 patents and work experience covering signal chain design, analog and digital motion control, and analog and digital power conversion IC design. He currently is the field applications engineer for MPS in Minnesota. So if you don't mind, give me a, or let's help me welcome Mark Hagen. So this is, can you hear it? Yeah, it's going, all right. So here's the outline. I'm going to talk about, uh, essentially I'm going to talk about USB power delivery and how that works and we'll, we'll drill down a bit so that you understand how that is. Um, uh, but to get there we'll talk about USB in general. And so I work for a power semiconductor company so it's the power side of this that, that uh, we're going to talk about. Um, if you have questions about the, uh, the data signaling in USB, I know a little, 
but I know a lot more about the, the power delivery aspect of it. So the Universal Serial Bus was started out by IBM and a few other folks uh, in 1994. The original standard came out in 96. The, the data transfer rates were uh, one and a half and 12 meg megabits. The first Windows uh, drivers for this were in 97. Uh, Apple you put a USB port on their iMac in 98. And uh, this is right out of Wikipedia, by the way, just so you know. Um, Wikipedia said that this is what really popularized it. Uh, then USB 2 was released in 2000, and that brought the serial data rate up to 480 megabits per second. And that's kind of where we've been for the last uh, decade and a half. Um, now USB 3, uh, it was published in 2008, but really uh, it started to really impact things more like about five years ago. USB 3.1 brought, so, US, so this 3 brings it up to 5 gigabits, which, uh, and then we also at that point started encoding the data. So 10 bits for every symbol, so it's <clears throat> roughly a half a gigabit, a half a big, big half a gigabyte uh, data data rate, and then 3.1 doubles that to 10. And they do this by uh, using a more efficient code and changing the, uh, the voltages on the signaling. Then USB 3.2, now we're getting to a recent history. So now we're getting into what we want to talk about tonight. This introduces the Type-C connector, and that has, uh, so, so USB 1 basically has a single lane, just a single pair uh, plus and minus data lines. Uh, 3.1, you now have a full duplex. So in addition to those original data lines that are still there, you have two more twisted pair, a high-speed data and a, a, a transmit and a high-speed receive. For USB 3.2, they now have two sets of a full deep duplex. So now there's the original data lines, and then there's two pair of twisted pair, uh, and that gets us up to 20 gigabytes. And then in the last few months, they've announced there's no products out here yet, but USB 4 will essentially absorb Thunderbolt, the uh, display port, uh, and that's supposed to double this again. And, and don't ask me how they're doing this, because uh, as I understand it, it'll be the same, uh, the same connector. So assuming they're just doubling the clock rate and doing, uh, doing some more uh, equalization on the channel to, to get it better. Um, so here's the connectors, and you should be familiar with all of these. Uh, well, if, if you have an Apple phone, you should be familiar with everything but this one, and if you have a Samsung, you should recognize this, right? So the Type-C connector is uh, smaller than the Type-A, but it has uh, a lot more pins, and I'll show you this in a second, right? So that uh, unfortunately, this is a little out of place historically, right? So type A, type B was only used on printers. You still see it around occasionally. Uh, the mini, I don't know, I see this on uh, low-cost uh, speakers and things. The micro uh, on just about every phone other than an Apple. And then this uh, uh, super speed micro. Um, We'll talk about this in a second, too. So here's the connectors, right? So uh, on type A, the, you have VBUS and ground and then two data lines. And the VBUS is always 5 volts, and it's always there. So 
like when people said, hey, we need to charge this phone, I gotta charge this uh, 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 remote speaker or something. Instead of using like a barrel power cord, everybody went to using this because we got five volts here, right? For the micro, it's the same signaling, but they add this ID pin. And this, all this is, is it's open on one side and grounded on the other end of the cable. So uh, if you have a micro B cable that's micro B on either side, it, there's a micro B A and a micro B B, and A is just uh, uh, rectangular, and that's supposed to be the host side. And then, and then the B, which is uh, trapezoidal, is supposed to be the, the, the power device side. And then here we have the, the micro AB super speed, um, which is basically this with exactly that uh, signaling. But here we add a set of a TX and RX twisted pair to do the super speed. Okay? And, it's, you know, um, when I wrote this, I said, I, I had, five years ago, I had a laptop that had one of these sockets on it, and I think that was the last time I saw it. But this afternoon, I was uh, working on a, a Intel server platform, and to test this out, you, you have to buy the $7,000 uh, Intel test uh, fixture, and lo and behold, it's got one of these sockets on it. So. Right, and then here's, so here's type C, okay? So we have the same data lines we had before. Uh, on the socket, there on either side, or excuse me, on the, yeah, on the socket, there's four pins here. On the actual cable, there's just two wires. And uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Then there's the CC line, CC1, CC2, and then secondary bus one and secondary bus two. V bus, this is where we deliver the power. Same as, oops, same as up here. And now you can see we have two pairs of RX and TX. So now we go from 10 gigabytes to 20 gigabytes. Um, and then there's Apple. So the lightning co connector, <laughs> Uh, so, I learned a lot uh, preparing for this presentation. One of the things I didn't know is uh, Apple, an Apple phone detects that you've plugged in the lightning connector when this uh, metal shield on the connector shorts out these wires here. And then the phone says, oh, somebody just plugged in the cable, and then what Apple does to figure out what orientation you're in is in the, oops, in the cable here, there's a, there's a Texas Instruments EEPROM. It's a one wire EEPROM and you w read it on that pin right there. And that, uh, that will tell the phone that it's a, uh, it's a proper Apple cable. And what is the orientation? Is it right side up or upside down? Okay. And apparently, so there's, there's two lanes here of uh, differential data. And um, Apple will re, um, reassign these pins depending on what they're doing. Because they're a closed system, they can do that. So, uh, for the original USB, the USB 2 standard says that you can deliver, you must deliver 500 milliamps at 5 volts on VBUS. So that's enough to run a, 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 a keyboard or mouse or something, right? But it takes a long time to charge a phone. So all the phone manufacturers came up with their own way of uh, determining if it was a charger instead of a, a, a standard data uh, cable plugged into the phone. And 
So these are, these are the, if you're a company like MPS and you want to sell a chip that uh, gets used for charging phones, today these are all the, the schemes you have to support. And uh, you can't, I can't tell you uh, which one this is, apparently, for fear of being sued by a certain company in Corputino. But uh, divider mode is basically what, what, in each of these cases, what we need to do if we're a charger, if we're a wall wart or a socket in a car, is we need to advertise to the phone how much power they can draw. That's the way to think of this, okay? So, uh, it's like a, an Apple, uh, you know, wall wart charger will advertise that it can deliver 12 watts up to 2.4, well here, I have exactly these in my, in my, right? Oops, I only have one. So, so this is a 12 watt charger. I wonder where my other one was. Um, if it's the small one inch cube, it's a five watt, five volts at one amp, and they put basically a, a set of resistors on the data lines. And that advertises to the phone how much power they can draw. Uh, BC 1.2, let's call this a, a, an LG or a, a Motorola phone. It will short uh, the plus and minus data lines. And that will tell the phone, oh, I can draw what I need to draw here. Uh, Samsung uh, puts 1.2 volts on it. And uh, newer Samsungs use a Qualcomm quick charge. And uh, this will go up to 12 volts at 3 amps, okay? And so here's the table, right? So the way this usually works if you're going to make a semiconductor is you start out in divider mode and work your way down this table, okay? Until, you've, you've, uh, until the phone recognizes and starts drawing power. So USB.org looked at this and said, this is kind of a cluster. Why don't we, why don't we do a standard, uh, you know, to support all this and make it, you know, make it good uh, across the board. So they did that, and that's called, uh, up until a few months ago, it was called USB Type-C. Now, uh, as of, I think, like, September or something last year, the official names for these standards are USB-C and USD-PD. And PD stands for power delivery. So, so both of these use that Type-C connector that's got the high data rate uh, and the extra pins. And uh, because we're now going to support higher power levels, uh, we want a mechanism to put higher voltages out here, right? And um, in addition to that, we're going to use these CC lines to, to advertise the power level. So the rest of what we're going to talk about here is, um, is how do you do that? How do, how do you negotiate with the phone to get a higher power level to charge faster? And uh, so we'll go through this. So this is why you came, right? This is uh, when you go away from here tonight and you meet somebody at the water cooler tomorrow, you can be a, a nerd and tell them exactly how this works. The difference between a nerd and a geek, they both want to tell you the details of a, uh, of a technical thing, but uh, a geek is, is anxious to tell you. <laughs> um, so step one is uh, so and and this is this is uh, so right now in in 2020 uh, to 21 for sure model year cars this is what cars are doing there's, there's no cars on the market today that do uh, power delivery yet. But 
uh, if um, every uh, Nissan that I've rented this last year has got one type A and one type C socket in it. So that type C socket in that Nissan um, is, this is what it's doing. So we're going to use the CC signals to define the orientation. And you can see here that, so there's a, uh, if it's 15 watts, I, these are the values. There's a 10K resistor from 5 volts in the charger. The cable will run, uh, run through from uh, CC, from one side CC to the other. And then it also has these resistors here, which are, well, on a, on a, um, a not an active cable, so a passive cable, they're 1K resistors. But you can also have what's called a marked cable that will respond to signaling on here, we'll talk about in a second. And in that case, this resistor here is replaced with a chip. And you're going to power it from 5 volts through this 10K resistor. Okay? So, uh, what happens is when you connect the socket in, you complete this circuit here, and you get 1.67 volts here or here, and both of these, so the phone is looking for that voltage, and the charger is looking for that voltage, and when they see, when this guy sees that voltage, he knows he's got a connection here, and then he'll turn on the V-Bus, okay, to start chart. And if it's USB-C, you're done. At that point, when he sees that voltage, he's basically advertising to the phone, you can draw 15, 15 watts, start charging the battery. Now, so power delivery, or USB PD, takes this, but it's still using uh, these resistor values here to do this initial handshake. So for PD, we're still using the CC lines to communicate. We're still using them to understand the orientation of the, which way you plugged it in, one way or the other. Okay? But it's now also the uh, bias for uh, the differential signaling that we're going to put on the CC lines. And oh, by the way, the, the original USB PD standard uh, that came out a few years ago didn't do this. They wanted, they, it, it defined doing uh, frequency shift keen modulated data on the VBUS, which was a horrible idea. <laughs> Is any, anybody here ever worked on wireless charging? Yes. Yeah. So Mark and I know what a crappy, job, crappy idea that is because VBUS is low impedance. You need to put a ton of energy on there to wiggle it just a little bit. And they figured that out, and then somebody said, well, duh, we got these CC lines. Let's put data on that. So they changed the whole thing about two years ago completely. So this is a lot cleaner solution, and this is what's going forward. So uh, I'll show you the, the circuit in a second. But so on the CC lines, we can put this. So VCon is an auxiliary 5 volt bus that's there to chart to to power uh, an active cable or a marked cable. Okay, and then the RP and the RD are the uh, termination resistors on either side, right? This guy's terminated to 5 volts. This guy's turning to ground, uh, and then uh, there's a phi. And the phi puts five bit symbols that encode four bits of data. Uh, and then it puts a packet of data out there. And it's, th this, is, this is very similar to the uh, serial signaling that goes on the data lines, except this is at 300 k bits per second instead of uh, 10 gigabits per second. Okay, uh, and the modulation that it does is biphase mark coding, which is a form of 
Manchester encoding, which is how we used to encode data on hard disk drives in about 1985 or so. Um, so I, a one has a transition in the middle of the, the bit and a zero doesn't, okay? And um, so we're gonna go into this a little more here. So, uh, so this is the data that we're gonna send. So, like I said, on the, on the charger side, uh, so, so we have the RP terminated to five volts, and on the, the load side or the slave side, RD is terminated to ground. We have some cable in between here with some reactive uh, transfer function. And uh, this guy is going to look at this voltage here, and depending on the voltage, it's going to determine if... Because uh, uh, the other thing about US, the USB Type-C standard is that power can go uh, bidirectional. So the idea is it's, you know, today, if you're going to charge your Apple, you have a Type-A on one end and a Lightning on the other. And it always goes that way. The, you know, USB 2.0 with the Mini, you know, Mini A and Mini B, same thing. Mini A is supposed to be the host side, Mini B is supposed to be the slave side. Type C, they said, we want to make this bidirectional. Um, so this laptop over here has got a Type-C socket on it. It can be used to charge that laptop, but it could also be used to charge a cell phone, right? So uh, the standard says the way you tell the direction of the power is what resistor you put on here and therefore what voltage you have on that node. So here's the packet. So now we're, now we're getting right down to the guts of this. So, uh, so the encoding here, like I said, they're five bit symbols for four bits of data. And if you look at, uh, so four bits, you got 16 combinations of data. Five bits, you have double that. So what are the words we're not gonna use? What are the symbols we're not gonna use? And if and if the, the ones they don't use are the ones with really long uh, runs of zeros. So, right, so that the, uh, uh, the phi on the receiving side has the best chance of reading the data. So the preamble is a, a 64 uh, uh, symbols of uh, ones and zeros, uh, unencoded, okay? And then the start of packet, so in the standard SOP asterisk means it could be either a port to port uh, uh, sync, it could be a port to the near plug or port to a far plug. So in other words, there's, a, there's an IC on the, sock, on the cable I'm going to talk to either the IC on the, on the plug close to me or the one on the far end. And in the standard, when they say asterisk, it means any one of the three. So, um, so here's the three sinks. So the sinks are uh, four symbols in a row. So if you see uh, sink one, sink one, sink one, sink two, you know that, oh, there's a, there's a USB uh, PD charger out there. Okay, um, then we send a message header, and I got that on the next page here, and then uh, we're gonna send data. It's followed by a 32-bit CRC and an end of packet. So here's the message. So uh, there are control messages and data messages. Control messages are basic, usually a response. Uh, the most common one is this one right here. I got your packet and I calculated the CRC and it was good. Okay? Um, and then data, the ones that really matter here that we're going to talk about 
our source, care, source capabilities and sync capabilities. So we'll talk about that. Um, it, the header itself, um, it, it has a field here that tells you what rev of the spec is this. When we wrote the firmware, what rev of the spec were we using? And when, these, when, when a charger and a phone handshake, this is the first thing they're going to do. Well, the first thing they're going to do is that handshake with those resistors, right? And I don't know if it times out. I don't know exactly what it does. But if it doesn't see anything else beyond that, it just says, oh, OK, it's a 5-volt wall work. Let's start charging. Um, if there's data, the first thing that they pass back and forth is the spec, spec revision. And it'll choose the lowest spec revision that it finds, right? So if you're writing firmware for this, you're obliged to make everything backwards compatible. So uh, and then once you've done that, the next thing that it's going to do is the, the charger, the, the phone is going to say, send me your um, their source capabilities. And um, it's going to send a packet that's got uh, seven 32-bit objects in it. And this is what an object looks like. And so what, it's, what the charger is basically going to say, and it wouldn't have to, some of those could be empty, but it's going to send, it's going to say, I, you can configure me to get X amount of power in one of these seven configurations. Pick one. And the most important part about this is these bottom bits here. What's the voltage and what's the max current? OK. So um, all right, we're almost there. So what are those power levels? For USB PD, these are the power levels. So 5 watts, 1, one amp at 5 volts. 15 watts, 3 amps at 5 volts, 27 watts, 3 amps at 9 volts. Thir there are some systems out here at 30 watts. Uh, 45 is 3 amps at 15 volts. 60 is 3 amps at 20. And 100 watts is 5 amps at 20. So typically, typically uh, we don't go above 3 amps. And then do you want 5 volts, 9 volts, 15 volts, or 20 volts? Um, so right now, like uh, the car companies, Ford, GM, VW, whatever, are, are working with uh, their suppliers who are then working with us. And right now, automobiles, most of them are going to put 45 watt sockets in their cars for like the 2020, 20, or 2022, 2023 model year. Because Let's think about this. You had a minivan, uh, and you got USB sockets all over the minivan. You got them in the front seat and the back seat. Maybe you got eight sockets in there. If they were all 100 watts, it'd be 800 watts you're going to pull from the battery. Every time you pull up to a, uh, and, and it's a new car, that every time you pull up to the stoplight, the engine stops. <laughs> right? And so they're like, no, we're not going to do that. So what we're seeing is mostly 45 watts. There are some, I think GM right now has got a spec that says, uh, we'll run at 60 watts if it's the only one, uh, only socket running. But if somebody plugs in a second phone, we're going to renegotiate and go to 45 watts. Or, and then some other ones are like 45 watts, and we'll drop down to 27. So and then uh, there is a. There's another version of this that's called PPS, Programmable Power Supply. And in that case, um, you add an extra step to this handshake. You send down your source capabilities, and then the phone says, uh-uh, ah, uh-uh, uh-uh, this is what I want. And it sends up its sync capabilities, OK? Which are, it's the same data, the same 
the same scheme here, but now it's saying, I want this much current. Okay? And I want, uh, in this case, in, in you know, 50 millivolt units. So uh, you could say, I want 2.45 amps at, at uh, 10.25 volts. And then the charger, if, if it supports PPS, would be uh, obliged to configure himself for that voltage and current. So here's, here's how the handshake works, you know, from beginning to end. Um, the down-facing port, which is uh, the terminology used in the standard, will set the RP register, and when the circuit is completed by the RD register in the phone, then it knows the orientation of that Type-C plug, and it knows, uh, and the phone knows that it can, if this is a 10K resistor, pull at least 15 watts or up to 15 watts. Um, and the next thing it does is it pings the cable with uh, uh, to look and see if the cable is an active cable. It tries to talk to any ICs that are in the cable. All right? Um, and then, uh, so the upstream up-facing port, this, this is the phone, okay? If it gets an acknowledgement, then he knows it's USB PD, right? Then they exchange the spec revision information. Then the down-facing port sends the PDO table. And uh, so those of us that are working on these things, you know, this comes up all the time. What's the PDO table? Okay? There's seven, up to seven entries in the PDO table. And then the upward-facing, the phone, does a request command, and that's one of those bits in the header, and says, I select, uh, uh, you know, PDO number three. And then uh, the down-facing uh, charger configures the power supply for that and sends a power supply ready control message. Uh, so control message are just a header, there's no data, and then charging begins. So, so what does the hardware look like? Well, uh, if you have MPS hardware and you're in a car, there would be uh, a voltage regulator here. I guess we don't even show it. The battery is coming in here. And this device will either step the battery voltage down to 5 volts or step it up to 20 or anything in between. And then you'll have another IC that is talking on the CC line. So this guy has got the protocol engine and the PHY in it. And it's got an I2C port here talking back to this thing to configure this. Okay. Um, now, in a car, if you're going to deliver 100 watts, um, that that turns out to be uh, actually a pretty challenging electrical engineering job because it's, it, it's, a, it's a real thermal design challenge. Because let's say we're, uh, so I worked through this and I have a spreadsheet. We could, we could go into this if you want. But so um, there's, so the device that's the voltage regulator has got four transistors. So it's called a four switch buck boost. If we're going to step down to five volts, we toggle these guys such that the average voltage here is five volts. We turn this guy on all the time and then we can deliver five volts out here. If we're going to take our 12 volt battery or when you're running the starter motor, maybe nine volts, and we're going to boost it up to 20 volts here. Then we turn these transistors on, turn this guy off, and then we toggle these. So we charge the inductor by uh, running current through here, and then we turn this off, turn this on, and that energy goes out here and charges up this cap. So when you're boosting, 
you can only deliver energy out here to this, the output cap and to the load when this guy is on. And so the, this guy can only be on when this guy is off. So that if we talk about the duty cycle of a regulator, we say that the, the duty cycle is the time that this guy is on. Right? And so what, what that means, if I'm going to deliver 100 watts, I've got to get 5 amps out here. If I'm going to boost from 9 volts to here, I need about 60% duty cycle. So this is on 60% of the time. So 60% of the time, I can't charge this. So that means that uh, the current that I have to deliver have in in here and coming out this way has got to be one over 60%. So to deliver 5 amps here, I got to have 11 and a half amps here. And now that means I got to have 11 and a half amps here and here and here. And all of these things are cooking the circuit board. So, uh, so even if you have a very efficient, so this is this is damn efficient, 95.5% efficiency. I still have to burn 5 watts. And 5 watts is a lot of heat to have to get out of a small little plastic enclosed uh, assembly behind the dash in a car. <laughs> so In Arizona in the summer. In time. Arizona. <laughs> so although we have all this really cool you know, stuff here, in practice we spend all our time Working on this, okay. Um, so the way to think of this is, well, uh, Grant. Grant works for the. So the engineering guys here, they have access to finite element analysis, uh, thermal tools, but most of the guys I work with don't. So. But you can get pretty close to understanding how hot it's all going to get. And the key, at least this is the key that I came across, is to understand, especially if it's not a very big board, the thermal resistance from point to point on that PCB is pretty low. So the whole PCB is going to be at one. You can, you can approximate it by saying it's at one temperature. Okay. And that kind of points to uh, now we now we can we can build an electrical model to model our, our the thermal uh, heat flow on our board. So you so if you pull up the data sheet for our voltage regulator, we will tell you the thermal resistance from <coughs> this chip down into the circuit board. And we will tell you the overall thermal resistance of this test board to the atmosphere, right? So this, this uh, from our guy down into the board, that's, uh, that's theta uh, JC. And from this whole thing into the atmosphere, that's theta JA. But we can take that and kind of parse it out and come up with thermal resistances to um, the, the copper on the board, the FR4, and uh, to the environment. And then we could just build a model. And I use LT Spice because it's a great free tool. So this is just a model in LT Spice. Uh, so every source of uh, energy of, of heat is a current source. And then every connection from that source of heat to like the, the copper that, you know, the top layer on the board or to the uh, environment, the, the ambient temperature is a resistance. So you could just build this up and then just tell Spice to give you the operating point and you, because the temperature of each element in here are the node voltages. So we, uh, just for kind of completeness, here's an example of a wall warp. And uh, 
This is a flyback regulator, so that 110 volts comes in here. Uh, this is the main switch, right? It's a flyback, so it operates like a, a boost, like we were talking before. You pull energy uh, to ground through the primary, and then you let it go. This voltage will fly up above the input voltage. That will forward bias the output, and you can deliver energy up to the output here, right? Now, uh, uh, this is, in fact, a 60-watt design. At 60 watts, we're delivering three amps out here. So if we just had, if we just had a diode, even if it's a shot key, you're going to have a half a watt across that diode, a half a volt at three amps. That's a one and a half watts. That's, you know, put your finger on that, it's going to burn the part number into your, into your finger, right? So, uh, so we put a FET here. And the FET is controlled so that, in this particular case, we hold 50 millivolts across it instead of 500. Okay, uh, and so this chip right here is very popular for wall warts because it it straddles the uh, it's a wide SO package. It'll straddle from the primary to the secondary side. It'll it'll control this guy, turn this thing on and off, and it it actually has a digital interface that it's capacitively coupled from one side to the other. So there's an air amplifier over here telling the primary side, give me more or give me less, right? And then exactly what we're going to set the output voltage to is, is a current that we're going to feed this thing on this feedback pin. And that comes from this chip here. And this is the most common chip used right now for USB and USB PD. It's a Cypress CCG3. Um, basically what it is, it's one of the microcontrollers with that Phi hardware in it and dedicated firmware, right? And so it, it's going to do the handshaking on, this, on the, the USB uh, PD interface and then it's going to send a current back over to the regulator to hold this voltage at 5, 9, 15, or 20 volts or something in between if it's PPS. So, in summary, uh, USB type, USB C, USB PD, you won't say type anymore. Uh, everything's going to switch to these. Um, Apple, everything, the Apple's going to have the socket on it too, I think, within a year. Um, the way it works is it makes a contract with your phone to set the power level. It uses those resistors to first determine the orientation of the cable and to advertise the power. And then it modulates uh, using the voltage set by those resistors as a bias to send packets back and forth to de determine the power level. Um, you obviously you can charge your phone a lot faster at 45 or 60 watts than at 15, right? So an I, I looked this up. An iPhone 11 has got a, a three amp hour battery. So at three amps, it's going to take about an hour to charge, right? To charge up a battery, you uh, you start with a constant. You you charge it at three amps and you watch the voltage. And when the voltage gets up to 4.1 or 4.2 volts, then you switch to just holding that voltage on there. And then you watch the current. And when the current drops down below, usually about a quarter of an amp, then you say it's charged. Okay? Uh, at 45 watts, if you do the math, you could charge at 10 amps, and you'd be done in 18 minutes instead of an hour. But at present, I don't know of a battery chemistry that would allow you to charge at 10 amps. So. Now you know how USB PD works. <laughs> Any questions? You put the picture of uh, USB-C up there again. The, the pinout? Yeah, well, physical, yeah. 
Yeah. What it looks like. Oh, what it looks like. Yeah. So this is this is better than a lightning connector because uh, where's lightning? Okay. What's the problem with lightning? Why, why do we get in trouble with uh, the lightning connector? Do you know? Scrape up the pins? Break them. That, that um, the, the uh, 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 conductors are exposed. And if you drop it down into the 12 volt, you know, cigarette lighter adapter socket in your car, you let the smoke out of your cable. <laughs> so type C was specifically designed to address that. And it's shielded. Anything else? Could you list some scenarios where you'd want the smarts in the cable? Pardon? Uh, some scenarios where you'd want some of the smart uh, device uh, responses in the cable itself. In the connectors, because you said like there's SOP, well, SOP um, prime and SOP prime prime. So to get 100 watts, it's got to have, you um, You first have to negotiate with the cable and get approval to put five amps through it. To ensure the So that's the one thing. Capacity, um, is that right? Yeah. You, you know, there's that EEPROM in the Apple cable, and I think they were just trying to address that. Okay. <clears throat> so it's... So how are we going to avoid a nightmare with different cable types getting, you know, consumers are going to grab the cable oh, that's in the drawer. USB.org is trying to make it not a nightmare for you, right? We're, okay. That was the whole point of this, is to try and address everything they could imagine. Okay. Um, so, for instance, if you buy a, uh, in the last few years, if you buy a power bank, you know, like I've got a 10 amp hour battery in my, that bag over there, that will charge my phone when my flight from O'Hare to Rochester gets canceled, right? right? And uh, it's got a type A, it's got two or three type A sockets on it, because I have an Apple, so that, that's what I need, all right? Um, but if you get a type C power bank, it only has one, and you use, or, or maybe two, but they're bi-directional. So you plug in your type C cable to charge it, and you plug in your Type C cable to pull energy out. That's it has a semiconductor company is good because we now we get to sell you not only the regulator <laughs> but uh, a handful of load switches to you know which yeah, way is the power right. going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So speaking of that bidirectional charging with Type C, uh, you had mentioned I think at one point that there was a single resistor that was used to determine what direction the charge was being sent? Yes. Is there any way on the software side of things of saying switching that, um, depending on the charge of the devices? Well, so these resistors are part and parcel of the PHI. So the software would, call, would talk to the PHI and say, uh, I mean, in practice, this isn't a reason. There's like three resistors uh, in, in parallel here with a FET to turn them on and off, right? So, um, so there's undoubtedly a bit in a register someplace that's going to configure that RP register now, so that you would write to in the firmware. How would that handle? Like if I, so if I take that uh, 10, Well, okay. Can I so, my laptop to charge off that battery? Or so that you, battery charge off my you won't be writing this software unless you go to work for Cypress. Sure. Okay. But uh, uh, so Aptiv or Molex or TechVox or uh, BCS, any of these guys that are writing or building these uh, modules that would go into a car, for instance. Um, what they did up until last summer 
is every quarter someplace on the planet, USB.org has a, a, a certification workshop. A lot of them seem to happen in Taiwan. And you go there and they rent out uh, a whole bunch of conference rooms in a hotel and you go from one conference room to another, to another, to another, and you test, 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 test. And then if you pass everything, you're certified. Okay. Now they've decided because the power levels and the, and the thermals are such a big deal on PD, they stopped doing that. And instead, they've contracted with test houses, kind of like you go for uh, FCC approval now. So you go to a test house, and it takes the better part of a week, and you see if you pass or fail. So it's an evolving thing. So, so on, okay, kind of continuing that line of questioning, if I've got a power brick, I know it's only going, it's delivering power. Right. Okay. If you've got a laptop or the, the portable brick you got there, it can either be charging or it can be the charger. Right. And to, how do you get it? How does it know which way to set up? Especially uh, like if you're using your laptop to charge your phone, you know, you want to charge your laptop, but if you got the same connection, how does it know? So if, if the phone says, if, if, uh, if somebody says, um, do you want to accept power from me, and you're not set up for that, you, you just reject it. But That's my understanding. In the case of a device that is capable of both accepting and sending power, how does it handle it? Like the laptop, for example, uh, can it um, accept power over the USB-C or send power? There's about 50 pages on this in the standard. <laughs> <laughs> Give us the short version. <laughs> so is there, is there it, is, on the it is way more complicated when you want to have uh, roll reversals than if it's just a wall wart charging a cell phone. Sure. Right? Well, is, is it like an app notification that pops up and says, hey, do you want to, do, you know, somebody's plugging in, do you want to receive power or send power? So I mean, it's it, all it, in the handshake. I mean, right. it's, well, it's but, all, but, this is the entire, this is the entirety of the information right here. So it's all done with these, uh, you know, 32 bits or whatever this is. Right. But if I've. Completely without user input? Yeah, if you've got two devices that are each capable of both delivering and receiving power, yeah. and you connect them together, you so, say, okay, one of you's got more power than the other, yeah, well, and you want to okay, charge so, the other way. I mean, how do you do it? It's a. Uh, uh, crap, I can't remember. Um, What's the official name for the a standard stack that goes phi, link level, protocol level, application level? I can't remember, right? Yeah. So there's a driver someplace, yeah. right? At some point, you're at the operating system. Right. I think that's what we're asking is when we plug this device into our laptop and it's a, it's a, a battery pack, does something pop up and say, do you want to charge the battery pack no. or do you want to charge the laptop? No, I don't think so. I haven't seen that. Well, so how do, what happens then if you do that? I suppose if you both, so if you're also plugged into AC, <laughs> it would um, or, or are we not so, there yet? Well, so <coughs> if it's a power bank, so, uh, okay, all right, that, okay, let's go back. Right here, okay? So if power's going this way, uh, I have, you know, 1.67 volts here. Okay, if it's 15 watts. If power's gonna go the other way, um, then we pull this guy down. So that, uh, this guy is gonna pull this up. Okay, so I only showed one direction here, but if you look at, if you go get the standard and look at the diagrams they have in there, they'll show, I could pull it up here, but they'll show an either an RP or an RD on either side. So. If this guy says, I want to give you power, he's going to pull him up, and he will start delivering power if he sees that this guy pulls down and answers that. Okay, sure. Yeah, but inside each device, they got to decide, am I going to pull high or low? And right. So, and so, like, a wall ward is always only a wall going to have, always going only to go have an way. RP. It will not yeah. have an RD. Right, right. But for a, and, one that can go either way. Until... 
you know, until RPU, you know, comes up with a way to deliver power from your phone. <laughs> no, it's the brick. The brick is the, quick, is the tricky one. Well, you can have your phone recharge your Bluetooth. USB cable. I have a laptop that can both send and receive power over USB. You have a laptop that can both send and receive power over USB. Yeah. Wireless. I have no clue. <laughs> I don't either. I, I, mean, I don't exactly want to test it because I don't want my laptop to break. But I feel like someone should know the answer. So I, 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 it's not going to break it because uh, I have worked with no company that hasn't gone to USB.org to get certified. I know one. Razor. They created a USB-C connector that delivered more than 100 watts to their laptops, uh, and they had several customers that fried their phones because of it. Yeah, well, that was <laughs> Don't plug it. whoever did that should be crucified. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, but there's at least one company that was mass-producing products. Sure, but there's also hacks. rapists and murderers <laughs> running around too. So, yes. yeah, yes. Um, I have my past three Android devices, um, but then from like I have a notification in my notification bar, and I click on it, and it generally says, "What do you want to do with this USB device?" And I can choose like what kind of like power. Oh, or very good. Power. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of the question I was getting at. Some, somewhere you get to make a decision. Right. Yeah, yeah there's happens. a notification would, that you can click on. on I would Android. think, though, that, that somewhere along the line, C is going to get mature enough that they're going to look at each other and say, who's got more power? Give it to me. Yeah. You know, and there won't be a need for a manual intervention. And make sure you plug the Coke on it first. Right, but if I want to charge my battery pack, I don't need my, my laptop may not have enough as much power as it does, but I want to top it off. I mean, that laptop right there is about, uh, it's at least three years old, maybe four. And so I have, that might not be bi-directional. Right, right. And, and that's the know. only case where I can see But see, it's, it's I mean, it's handled in the, in the standard, right? So, yeah, the oh, first thing it's going to do is yeah, go see, you know, what, what spec level am I, am I at? Yeah, no, I, I totally get that part. Yeah. I just started. Bill, Bill, did you have a question? Yeah, kind of a different subject, actually. Uh, back to your example about the minivan with a bunch of ports. How much duplication is required there, or how much sharing is, is possible between those various outlets all over the car? Um, I don't hear so good, so somebody... Oh, in, the, in the minivan with multiple ports, how much communication is there between the ports to ne negotiate? How many share power? Yeah. Yeah. How do, how are we going to share power? Everybody plugged in at once. Um. So. Uh, well, that, that was the. Oh, I'm sorry. That that that, so that power sharing right now does not go through the standard. So, like the the stuff we're doing for GM. Uh, if there's two right next to each other, like in the dash. Yeah. Um, so this this chip right here, uh, we don't show all the pins here, but there's uh, there's a power a couple of power sharing pins on here, and when it sees that the other guy is active, then this will then send a command down over the USB bus that says. Oh, excuse me. I said 45 watts. I really meant 27. So that right now, that that power sharing is not in the standard. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a USB. So USB C. Right now it's USB C 2.0. So I wouldn't be surprised if they define a power sharing scheme in 2.1. Uh, no, I'll stand, stand up. Maybe I can. My voice isn't very strong. <laughs> uh, the question was in the minivan where you got a whole bunch of ports. How much hardware sharing is is uh, required, or is is a complete it, duplication for every port? Yeah, each sharing? each one's pretty much an independent. Okay. And 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 oh, by the way, uh, 
this is last year's. Uh, uh, by third quarter this year, this is all one chip. And it's sitting about a half an inch behind the socket. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah. All right, maybe one more. Oh, way up, Mark. Is this, this is strictly power delivery that has nothing to do with data back and forth. So this, does this incorporate, is this incorporated from USB hubs where you have, you know, uh, thumb drives uh, or um, all those other data-driven things? It's, it, they're two separate things. They're two separate standards. They're two separate documents. I got them loaded up in case we wanted to drill into it, but there's, uh, it's USB 3.2. It just talks about data. It talks, you know, there's 300 pages there to talk about all the signaling, all the, uh, the, the channel equalization you have to do to get 10 mega, uh, gigabits per second. And then there's the USB-C that talks about the Type-C uh, um, uh, socket. And then USB-PD that just talks about everything we just talked about here tonight. So the hub wouldn't have to have power, OK? Um, it, if it doesn't, it won't, you know, it, it won't. If your phone start, tries to wiggle the CC lines, it, it, nothing will come back. And then your phone knows it can only pull half an amp. Well, do you have a few minutes yet? Just, if, if anyone else have any other questions? Can they come down and... Um, I, I know, we're, I know we're, we're holding up a beer, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one quick one. Uh, if you... The, picture that you put of USB-C up there uh, looks an awful lot like you could put that connector in upside down. Is that true? Exactly. So USB, don't you don't care. This. It's like the I lightning mean, cable. Yeah. You can go either way. Okay. Seems like Doesn't matter. Yeah. Go to the pin. Show the pin out of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that one. So look okay. at that. Flip it upside down. What do you see? A ground on the top right becomes a ground yep. on the top bottom right. You can line. flip it over. Yeah. And when you flip it over, the CC1 line will now be CC2. Okay. And uh, where's this picture here? And then now you'll see that 1.7 volts down here instead of up here. And then you know which way you plugged it in. So I have one more question, I guess. I have all these USB cables I've been buying over the last several years, and now I drove a car the other day that didn't have, that had the C in it. Is there only one C cable now? That'll last me for at least six months? Everybody, every, everybody's there except for Apple. Okay. Well, so, so, sort of. There's C's on both ends, or a C on one end and an A on the other. Right. Okay, so I can't plug it into my Apple phone, my iPhone. Yeah, so, that's so, so an Apple, uh, so a MacBook is C. Um, the only thing that's not C at Apple right now is a phone, and that's probably going to change this year. Okay, but my, it never support my old phone then that I have in my pocket right now. Uh, no, you can buy you can buy a cable that's so you could have a Type C wall warp, okay. and it's Type C on one end and Lightning on the other. You can buy that today. Oh, you can. Okay. Yeah. Last until your next phone. <laughs> so about six months. Yeah, right. Six At that point, months. Apple might lose the port altogether. Of course, the cables usually yeah. break anyway. It's all between all, all right. Well, this Thanks. was fun. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Any other quick questions? Thanks, Marco. But again, remember you're delaying his beer with time. So. <laughs> Uh, thanks again, Mark. Appreciate you coming down and, and uh, racing down from uh, Chippewa Falls. Uh, I got a safe trip home. Thank you. To, to know when to stop charging. That's a pretty trickle charge. Oh, okay. Actually, I might be a fan of this. But I mean, the, so you've got the charger, right? And it, it can be charging the phone or, or whatever. Right? But it, it, all, all this does is.
Yeah, I was uh, hired on before, so that, that one might predate me.